Welcome to the PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, August the 1st. I'm Mark Syme, the minister here at the Northfield Church. And per usual, as we uh, do this evening service virtually via YouTube, we will sing several songs in praise to the Lord. We will observe the Lord's Supper, and we will have a message that I hope will uh, lift us all up just a little bit. And so, if you would please, from Songs of Faith and Praise, if you have your books and you would like to sing along with us, turn your books to number 578, 578. All four verses. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe, all praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. 238, number 238. <clears throat> Let's sing it through twice. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me, you are the songs that I sing. And before the Lord's Supper, number 763. Seven sixty three. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me, the slow of heart, to move by some clear winning word of Teach me the way when feet to 
stay and guide them in the homeward way. In hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's running way. In peace that only Thou canst give with Thee, all Master, let me live. On the first day of the week, our Bibles instruct us uh, to gather about the Lord's table and uh, remember Jesus as he sacrificed himself for the sins of the world. And as we uh, examine uh, this part of our worship service, uh, we understand that uh, God's plan was thus from the beginning, uh, that Jesus would leave the heavenly realms, uh, come to earth, live in human form, and then die the one time and perfect sacrifice for all. It's a, an amazing story, and yet it is a more amazing event that took place. It's an event that uh, uh, changed and altered history on so many levels. And as Christians, it is the event that uh, gives us such great hope. It gives us such great hope of um, uh, God's grace being poured upon us. It give us, gives us great hope of uh, our, our, the ability that the Lord has to forgive our sins. And uh, it gives us that great hope of living one day with him eternally because we understand that uh, the grave could not hold Jesus and he did resurrect from the dead. So as we gather about the Lord's table, help us to do it in solemnity realizing how serious it is, yet realizing what a joyous occasion it is for us in our lives. Let's pray for the bread, please. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to give up his body, uh, that uh, he was willing to suffer the pain and the agony and the disgrace of being crucified. And as we partake of this bread, help us to hearken back to Calvary and the body that hung on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood. And uh, we understand as Christians that there is such great power in the blood that Jesus shed. It is the blood that washes away our sins. And so as we hearken back to Calvary, help us to remember that. Help us to remember the blood that was shed and the blood that uh, is uh, life-giving uh, to us as Christians. We pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And having completed the Lord's Supper, uh, as convenience uh, has it, uh, also on the first day of the week, we are instructed to lay by in store, to give as we have prospered, and uh, we have chosen this time. We could have chosen any time during the service. It's not necessarily attached to the Lord's Supper, but there is a, a, a startling kind of reality in it that we get the chance to give just as uh, God has given to us, just as Jesus has given to us. So let us give with an open heart. Let us give with gratitude and let us give with joy in our hearts. Let's pray together. 
Dear Lord, we thank you that not only we have the ability to give, that, but, with, but that we have the desire to give. Help us in our giving to understand that we give you but your own and that all blessings here on earth come from you. We're so grateful for the abundant life we have and so grateful that we can give something back to you. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And our last song will be uh, kind of wrapped around the theme of today's lesson. And so with two of us, uh, uh, it should be uh, interesting as we sing this, as uh, we have a lead part and an echoing part. So uh, if you are uh, there and you uh, want to uh, sing along with us, take your choice. You can sing my part or you can sing the echoing part. Okay, it's called Humble Yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 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 And he, and he will lift, lift you up. up. And he, and he will lift, lift you up. up. Now Jesus is the Son of God. Now Jesus is the Son of God. Now Jesus is the Son of God, now Jesus is the Son of God. and He, and he died, died for us, and He, and he, he died, died for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound! 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 The saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. When we've been there ten thousand years. When we've been there ten thousand years. When we've been there ten thousand years. Bright shining as the sun. Bright shining as the sun. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So and he will lift you up. And he will lift you up. Oh, I thought we did a great job with that. I hope you enjoyed it at home. And I hope you enjoyed our praise uh, that we gave to the Lord. And now for the message. Uh, you there this morning, you heard that the message tonight would be on humility. Pretty simple title. I usually get a little catchier when I uh, throw my titles out, but uh, uh, I got simple. Uh, it goes along with me. So uh, uh, the lesson is about humility. If you remember, uh, two weeks ago, we went to the third chapter of the book of Colossians, and um, I delivered a lesson called The New Self, Colossians chapter 3, uh, starting uh, over here at uh, uh, actually about verse 8 and 9. But uh, in starting with verse 12, it says, So those of you who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, it tells us, characteristics that we are supposed to have with our new self. It says, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against you, just as the Lord forgave you, you should forgive also. And so this is the new self. The new self comes equipped hopefully, with uh, our working on these very, very important 
characteristics. So I have zeroed in on one of those characteristics. Characteristics. It's one that we don't talk about a real lot. So uh, I thought it would be good for us to spend a, just a few moments this evening talking about humility. I, I think, you know, and I may be wrong, I may be way off base, that uh, many people today struggle with humility. Now, that being said, we may not struggle as hard with humility as the people of the first century did. Now, I'm going to lay the groundwork here, and as we talk about this uh, wonderful quality of humility, I'll let you know how hard it was in the first century to show humility, and then through comparison and contrast, Hopefully, we can see how we can make that a tangible and viable part of our lives today. It, it's pretty well known that humility in the first century, in what we call the Greco-Roman world, was not a virtue. It was not an ethic that was practiced. As a matter of fact, the term humility actually meant to them being crushed or being debased. Now, none of us wants to be crushed. None of us wants to be debased. And so if that were the way that the people looked at it in that age, we can see why they didn't practice humility. Now, how I will backtrack a little bit. Humility was practiced before the gods, of course, because it was appropriate. Those folks, the Greeks and the Romans, and they had those pantheon of gods, uh, as sometimes silly as we might think it is today, and they were humble and it was appropriate primarily because the people thought that the gods could kill them. And so I better be humble before these gods or they will do me in. It was also proper to show humility toward those that were way above us, like the emperors and the rulers and the governors. And it was advisable to be humble before them for exactly the same reason. They had literal physical control over us, uh, over the people at that time. And they could destroy them or incarcerate them. And so, uh, humility before others that were above us or before the gods was appropriate. However, here's where the line is drawn. Back then, humility toward a peer, P-E-E-R, humility before one who was on an equal footing with you was suspect. It was morally suspect. And so the big question, why? Why was it morally suspect? Well, because the people back then felt like that it upset the equation. They felt like, they felt that merit deserved honor. Thus, honor was the proof of merit. And so if you humbled yourself before someone, it was shameful. All right? So literally, ordinary citizens of limited significance 
felt the need to parade their accomplishments before others because that's all that they had. They didn't have much, and so they would parade their accomplishments before someone. If they did something good for someone, they would go about and let everybody know that they did something good for someone. Thus, when Jesus teaches humility, just as in so many ways with Jesus' teachings, for example, when he said to love your enemies, to go the extra mile, to turn the other cheek, when Jesus taught humility, it went contrary to the cultural meaning of the first century. And you have to remember, the earliest Christians, the people who were following Jesus, were a part of the Roman Empire. So part of that was in already, this idea of not being humble before your peers, was already ingrained in them. And so, it would be a challenge for Christians, and maybe this is true today also, fast forwarding 2,000 years. It would be um, a challenge to believers to manifest the proper meaning of humility. And so with that in mind, let's turn to the guidebook. I'm going to point you to four scriptures. Now, I'm going to point you to them very, very quickly. And so, if you want to, um, and, and of course, I guess you can play this over and over again, or if you want to take notes uh, to get those four particular scriptures and read them and meditate upon them, please feel free to do so. First, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5, says, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. All right, being proud before the Lord was being non-humble. That's Proverbs 16.5. Let's go to the New Testament, to Philippians, the second chapter, and the third verse. And Paul's writings say this, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Great scripture, isn't it? That's Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Now let's go to the epistle of James. James chapter 4, verse 6. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And finally, to the pen of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, where Peter writes, clothe yourselves with humility, and get this, toward one another. You see, the thread of these scriptures is that it's toward one another. It's not toward those who are well above us on the socioeconomic scale. Although that could be true also. But this says, this is to your peers. 
This is the people that you deal with every day, that you are to clothe yourself in humility with one another. And so with that in mind, maybe we need to step back and look for a practical meaning for humility. Now, just as the folks in the first century believed that it was okay to practice this trait of humility before an emperor or before his god or before a governor, so there is uh, no problem for us today to understand that we should show humility before our God. We can take that same tack. We can show humility before our God. The question is this, and here's the tough one. How do we manifest humility toward our peers? How do we manifest this trait of humility toward those that we deal with every day. Now, maybe in order to get this straight, we need to get some of the do's and the don'ts of humility. Now, first, because a person practices humility, it doesn't mean that I can't think highly of myself. Right? After all, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, Let us create man in the image of God. I feel pretty good about myself, spiritually especially, because I've been created in the image of God. So it's okay for me to think highly of myself. Now, what that does is it makes me valuable because I know that I have these some positive traits. Now, humility does not mean that one does not love self because Jesus succinctly said that we are to love others, Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39, as we love ourselves. So if Jesus teaches that we are to love one another, and we are to love one another as self, it must mean that we ought to love ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not being non-humble. If we don't have the proper love for self, we can't have the proper love for each other. I think that's pretty clear. Humility does not mean that we do not have pride in ourselves or the work that we do. Now, I spent 35 years of my life being a school teacher. And I'm here to tell you, I took pride in that. It was my life's work. This is what I wanted to be from the time I was 13 or 14 years old. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a coach. I fulfilled all of those things. And I took pride in that. Now, if I'm going to stand up here and tell you, I, I think I was a good teacher. If I wasn't, how could I have done it for 35 years if I wasn't good at it? I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 answers that for us. Humility does not mean 
that we do not recognize the talents and the abilities that God has given to us. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8 clearly lets us know that God endued us with certain abilities. I have abilities that others don't have. Other people have abilities that I don't have. It's okay for me to recognize these abilities and utilize these abilities for the good of the good, for the good of the Lord, for the good of others. Humility does not mean that should we should not be bold and not be confident in our work, especially our work as Christians. We should be proud of what we do as Christians. If we stand up for the truth of God's word, we should be proud of that. That's not being unhumble. We can still be humble and be proud of the abilities that we have and how we use those abilities to further God's kingdom. Now, here's the big one, I think. Some people don't practice humility because they tie humility with this, uh, I'll just let anybody run right over me. That's not what humility does. Paul, Paul was humble, but he defended his right to be treated properly. If you go to Acts chapter 16, verses 36 to 39, Acts chapter 25, verses 7 through 11, Paul was humble, Yet, he defended his right to be treated properly. Okay, I got three things here for you, and the lesson will be ours this evening. One, humility does mean we do not exalt ourselves, but give God the credit for our abilities and for what is accomplished. Here we go. It, it's not, look what I did, everybody. Look what God did. Look at what God has done. I was only able to accomplish these things because God was working in my life. Two. Two. Humility does mean we exalt others rather than seeking the limelight. Don't put ourselves under the spotlight. Exalt others. We're supposed to be all about encouraging one another on toward love and good deeds. We can't do that if we say, look at how good I am. You're going to have to go a long way to be this good. It doesn't work that way. People will chafe at that. It's not being humble. And finally, three. Humility does mean that we allow God to honor us, maybe through others, rather than being self-promoters. If we're doing good, if we're doing the Lord's work, other people will know it. We don't have to wear a billboard advertising it. People will know it. That's how John explained to us that people will know we are Christians because we love one another. We, had, we exhibit it. In the epistle of James, James talked about showing our faith through the works that we do, not being self-promoters, not giving our, ourselves all the esteem for the works, but the works being done 
by God. And so I hope uh, these words had a positive effect on you this evening. As you think of the importance of being humble as Christians. And even though the first century culture didn't count humility as a virtue, Jesus Christ did. All right? He went against that. We have to work and work hard to add biblical humility to our Christian character. So as it says in Colossians chapter 3, when we become Christians, we put on the new self. Humility has to be part of that new self. It has to be part of, of this, this fabric that is woven in us as Christians when we accept the Lord into our lives. And so remember that each day, that I have to be a humble person in God's eyes. Not that I shouldn't love myself, not that um, I shouldn't uh, uh, take you know, what I have done and understand that uh, uh, this came from the Lord and it was part of uh, the Lord's will. But remember that uh, God wants me and desires that uh, I do his good will in my life in a humble and a righteous fashion. If this evening uh, you have decided to follow the Lord, we have folks ready to assist you and to help you. Uh, I just pray that um, if you are ready to come to the Lord and you're ready to come right now, please call one of us and we will be ready to assist you in any way we can. Let's close this service in prayer. Dear God, just thank you so much for the life that you've given to us. And as we become Christians and put on the new self, Help us to understand that one of those characteristics of the new self is the characteristic of humility. Bless us as we try to be humble Christian people striving to do your work. Bless us as we uh, work hard to uh, just be a part of what uh, uh, you have uh, desired that we be a part of. Bless us in that regard, dear Heavenly Father. Be with those in our congregation that are, are ailing. I just especially ask that you be with Javier and Miranda, uh, especially Javier as he is in the hospital with COVID right now, uh, and, and just bless him and, and make him stronger each day that he can return back to his normal physical life. Bless us all, dear Heavenly Father. Help us all to come to you with our needs Help us to come with, to you with the needs of others on our heart and pray for them. Be with us. Help us in these times to stay well and to stay safe. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Good night. May God bless you all. On Zion's glorious summit stood a new